production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High, a local fiber and mixed media artist teaches us how breaking the rules can be a good thing. A Michigan artist describes how he sets the stage for his audience. We explore the ancient craft of water marbling with a Delaware, Ohio-based artist. And we groove to a smooth and soulful Columbus-based band. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Our first story is about fiber and mixed media artist Renee Warmack Keels. Renee works with her own hand-dyed fabrics, along with African prints, batiks, and commercial fabrics to create wall hangings that tell a story, often about African American women's lives. She considers herself a student of history and feels it's important to share the stories of those who were left out of written historical records. Renee loves combining colors and textures and regularly breaks the rules to create unusual combinations in her quilts. Let's take a look. My motto is, there are no mistakes in quilting, there are only design opportunities. When I was a child, I learned to sew, you know, those were the days of home economics. And I made the little apron and the little blouse that you make. So I fell in love with sewing. As time went on, I think when I was in high school, senior high school, I made a lot of my clothes. And then when my children came along, I started making my children's clothes. Through the years, I kind of got away from it. And then someone I was on a panel with, we were talking about the things that we'd like to do. And this person was telling me she was a quilter. And I said, well, you know, I've always been a sewer. And when I retire in 25 years or so, I'm going to learn to quilt. And she said, oh, Renee, don't wait until you retire. Let me teach you now. So I spent about two weeks with her learning how to make what is called a log cabin quilt. I wanted to learn the process. I wanted to learn the skills because I wanted to learn how to make art quilts. There are the traditional quilts that you would put on your bed versus the kind of thing that I make now that goes on your wall. There's something deeply spiritual about creating something. It's the playfulness. It's the letting your imagination run wild. There are quote unquote rules in quilting. And while I do try to make sure that my seams are straight, my sewing is straight, my points don't always you know, match up. My colors may not necessarily be analogous. I have put orange and, and purple together. I just love the idea of putting different pieces of fabric together and watching how they play together. I consider myself to be a narrative storyteller quilter. That is, my quilts tell a story, and typically they will tell stories about women's lives. What I want people to come away from is not only to be inspired, but to learn about the unsung heroes, uh, sheroes, I guess I should say, the women whose stories are not told. Wild Women Don't Have the Blues is the first of a series of three quilts. I got interested in blues singers of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Alberta Hunter, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith. And I said, I, I'd like to tell the story of these singers in a quilt because sometimes people will never pick up a book and read it, but they might be willing to at least read a quilt that goes on your wall. The second quilt is called 
Cafe Ole and Brown Sugar Divas because in the entertainment industry, African-American women were sometimes uh, segregated according to skin color. In that quilt is a little different fabric. It's yellow tones, it's um, light brown tones because I wanted it to sort of mirror uh, the images of, of the women and, and their skin tones. Cocoa and Hot Chocolate Divas is uh, the quilt that I created for darker skinned women. Uh, Hattie McDaniel, B. Richards are in there. So that's how that series of quilts came into being. Maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, going through some really deep emotional turmoil and quilting became very therapeutic for me. There's a quilt that I do once a year, and that quilt is for my son who is incarcerated. One of the things that I could not do last year was to go see him. So one of my pieces is called, Your Blues Ain't Like Mine. And it's blue fabric, it's blue hearts, because I hadn't been able to visit him during the pandemic. That made it pretty difficult and painful for me. And as you can tell, this heart is not completely reconnected. And that's on purpose. That heart is reconnected, but this heart is not. Is there a point where you think you won't need to make one? I, I'm hoping so, yes. I'm, I'm hoping so. As I quilt, I'm thinking, you're leaving your own legacy of your own stories. And people may not know all of my story, but they will know some of my story. And hopefully that will encourage them to think about their own stories as well. In February 2020, Renee Warmack Keels and her friend Monica Scott founded Kaumba Quilters. Their organization is dedicated to preserving and promoting the art of quilting and culture in the African American community. You can see their work on display in their latest exhibition, Kaumba Connections, from February 6th through April 3rd at the Ohio Craft Museum. And to learn more about Renee's work, visit her website at metamorphosi.org. Next, we head to Michigan to learn about artist Mario Moore's exhibit, Recovery. In his paintings and silver point drawings, he reflects on how African-American men rest in our society. I'm interested in like creating a stage that the audience can kind of come into. Art to me has always been involved in my life. I grew up around the DIA. I used to go visit the museum when I was a kid. I would walk through the galleries. But as far as like inspiration, uh, that came from my mom, Sabrina Nelson, because you know she, I would see her do these large paintings. Just the idea to look at a canvas that's blank or a piece of paper and her just like make something was always uh, interesting to me. The way that I begin my work is usually through uh, sketches and ideas is usually that I have a thought and I have a process and I sketch out or I think about that thought and I say, what is the best way to portray this thought or to talk about this idea? So that can go to sculpture, that can go to drawing, that can go to video, that can go to painting. But the majority of the time, I'm interested in like a massive narrative. We're in the David Klein Gallery and the show is called Recovery. And the show is about considering how black men uh, rest and relax and take time for themselves. What happened was I was working on a body of work where 
I was thinking about myself personally and how I move my body through the world and how the world considers me as a black man. And then I had brain surgery. I had brain surgery and literally I was forced to rest. So that, that made me think about things historically, like how did historic black men that we you know we know and the world knows, like a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X or a W.E.B. Du Bois, and, and when we look up their names, they're always speaking really loud, they're on the podium, they're always active. Like in times of turmoil, like what we're dealing with today as far as everything politically and social economically how do i rest because we're kind of in a we're in a similar state and in some ways in some senses as far as education and other things like that it's it's worse it's gone backwards instead of forwards so but i'm, I'm at the same time we're human so these men took vacations they uh, took time with their family they took naps so I started to think about that and the work presents a question because I don't have the answer. So how do black men rest? How do they relax? And what does that look like? It has to do with just the history of America in that black men and black people, just in general, we're in the process of constantly having to stay ahead, right? Um, to just to catch up economically. Since we got to the country or the Americas, we were slaves. You know, we were. It was a. It was things that the country were, were built on the labor that we put in. So that is passed down as far as trying to catch up. You have to work extremely hard. So the idea of resting and relaxing is not a part of the process when you're always thinking about what do I need to do next. Silver point is a technique that was used in the 16th and 15th century and it's literally a piece of silver and drawing with a piece of silver. Most of the silver point drawings um, that have the historical, like the larger ones that have the historical figures in the background, it's a, it's a concept and idea is that can a black man look relaxed and calm and present himself in that way but also at the same time be powerful? Like, I'm letting the background, you know, the historical figures do all the work for me while I relax. And I think that's, you know, a part of the importance and a part of the process. I like the amount of texture and detail that went into the silver point, but there's a, a, a limited number of values that can, you can reach. So no matter what I draw, no matter how hard the subject matter is, it's always gonna be this softness to it. And I really like that. The other thing I really like about silver point is that you can't erase. So it's almost like drawing with a pen. Like whatever you put down is permanent, right? So, so everything that goes into that drawing, you have to deal with it, right? It's, it's there to exist forever. Another thing I like is that in dealing with silver point, you're, you're literally leaving behind silver on paper. So you're creating something that has an initial value. Um, and with the work that I was working on, I'm dealing with the subject matter that people don't see as valuable. America often sees as invaluable as far as black men and also this idea of rest, and this idea of relaxing. So I think that material has worked for me really well in thinking about these ideas and concepts. There's one piece in particular in the show. I read this book called Medical Apartheid. Uh, it has to do with the experimentation on black people from slavery to contemporary times. And I also got this uh, huge photography book called uh, Stiff Skulls and Skeletons. Through that book, you can see how they like experimented and practiced on cadavers. And the most of the cadavers you will see are um, black or African-American cadavers. And the way that that happened is they were like, well, we don't really care about this community, so we can dig up these graves and use these bodies. Right, so those bodies became objects. They weren't even people anymore. So it was like, well, the thing that just happened to me with my brain surgery, what would that look like you know, back in these times? And I wanted to show opposition to that, that shine the light on me as a person, as a human being instead of an object, and kind of like mute the light on the figures that are above me. The American Bulldog, for me, it's a literal representation of the history of America, and I use it as a symbol for America itself. And often, uh, you'll find the dog is sleeping or relaxing as it's ignoring um, really big issues that are happening right above it. I include history in my work because as far as social issues, we kind of roll around all the time back to similar issues over and over again. So I look at the past and I consider it and I'm saying, well, what was happening then 
kind of looks like now. What did they do then? What can we do now? What can we do to change it? And what does that look like? I think there's a ton of stuff to take away from this show. I think about a lot of different narratives that go into one piece, but there's a lot of stuff that I don't think about, and I think those are the important things that uh, people that come and see the show that they can pull out for themselves. I think it's important for the people to answer. Well, these are the things that I've noticed. These are some ideas that I'm thinking about. This is a question that I have, and I think it, it becomes more participatory that the people that come and see the show, they provide the answers. I think hearing their perspective and hearing their ideas about resting and what that looked like for them was extremely important. I think uh, hearing my dad talk about how he's worked since he was 16 years old and talking about his perspective was important. But I think the most important thing that happened after the show was I went into the barber shop and uh, one of the barbers that was in there, he told me after seeing my show, he literally took a week off of work. And then also hearing that uh, several men, you know, after seeing the show were going outside and crying, you know, which is like, like that, that they honestly never thought in this way. So I think those were probably the most important things that, that happened. To learn more about Mario's work, visit him at mariomorestudio.com. Our next story explores the art of water marbling. It's a centuries-old craft that was most commonly used to make those colorful end papers we would find inside the covers of old books. We travel up to Delaware to meet Susan Lichty to see how it's done 21st century style. We are water marbling. It's an ancient art that has been around since the 9th and 10th century. It used to be strictly for books and um, the covers of books and the inside of the book covers. And then it sort of started to disappear after the creation of the printing press and manufacturing of the books and not done by hand. It's a fascinating art form. Um, it's very easy. It doesn't look easy, but anybody can do it. We start out with a white silk scarf and drop the colors onto the water. The, the, the tray holds um, a thickened water. The water's thickened with, it's called carrageenan, which is seaweed. And it's mixed with water and it becomes gelatinous. So it has to be heavier than what the paint is. So the paint will float. And I use acrylic paint so that the paint is dropped into droplets on top of the water. And then we have probably a half a dozen tools and all it is is taking those tools and dragging them through the water and your designs change after each pass. Or you can be that person who just takes a skewer and goes. So depending on what kind of design you want, the tool does all the work. You're not doing the work, you're dragging the tool through the water and it creates your design for you. No two can be alike. <laughs> um, this is 100% silk. Um, it's called Habito silk. Um, after they're treated and ironed, then they will go into the water to really absorb all the paint. So then I have to, we go through and we just fold down the edges because they're rolled edges and the paint won't get over the top of it unless you push it down a little bit. So you ready to see it? My husband Jerry got involved in um, helping with this water marbling business because honestly you, it cannot be done by one person if you're doing the larger uh, scarfs like what we do. Paper you can do on your own. Um, these are a couple different designs of books that I do. These are the hardcover um, in canvas and then my paper goes on the inside and this is what is called end papers. The whole idea of end papers was to hide all of the spine and everything inside the book that was not always attractive. But it takes two to hold the scarf and drop it in the water. Yeah, you can't do this by yourself. We've 
tried different ways and it just doesn't work very well. This one's called an octopus design. This is a design called feathers. Find one here that's done by hand. This is done with a skewer. Um, we just drop the paints in the water and we take a, a wooden skewer through the designs. And this one's called a fountain because obviously it's got that design that flows that way. Probably our favorite pattern that we do the most of is called bouquet. And it's a very elegant old design from about the 1700s. You know, 500 years ago they did this. This was a huge business in Italy and France and England. It's unique. Nobody else is going to have one like it when I walk down the street. <laughs> Isn't that interesting when it's out? Learn more about the art of water marbling by visiting Susan's Facebook page. You can also find her at suesilkcreations.com. Someone once described Stephanie Amber's singing voice as honey ice cream on a hot summer day. Paired with the soulful and bluesy guitar sounds from Adam Darling, the Columbus band's name was born. Together, they are Honey and Blue, and they performed a track off their album, All the Feels. the same so many lies so many nights your body on minus two they say this loving is blind I put my eyes and hold on fire I could not put aside all of all your feet you love me and leave me say that you need me I just decide I'm not a quitter but I don't win there when I see you
Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.